Welcome to episode number nine. I'm CJ Wellerman. Thank you for joining us. This week we examine why it has never been a more important time for the United States to finally come clean on the war crimes its military forces have committed around the world, particularly in Afghanistan and Iraq. Firstly, however, a quick reminder that if you enjoy the show and would like to help us reach a greater audience and receive exclusive benefits in return, then please become a member at patreon.com slash CJ Wellerman. And please also make sure to hit the subscribe button below. Now let's get into it. There's simply no arguing against the fact that the United States has once again stumbled into another Cold War against a rival superpower, this time against China. But unlike Cold War version 1.0, this is not a contest between communism and capitalism, but between authoritarianism and democracy, with US President Joe Biden championing global human rights and international law. But Biden must know this, that when you call out war crimes and genocide committed by your geopolitical rivals, while at the same time covering up your own and all those committed by your friends and allies, then you not only sound like a self-serving hypocrite, but also you undermine and sabotage your own moral authority. For example, here's the US State Secretary rightly slamming China for committing human rights abuses against Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang and other oppressive violations in Tibet and Hong Kong. But when Israel slaughters and abuses innocent men, women and children in the occupied Palestinian territories while operating a system of apartheid, the same dude offers not a single word of condemnation. And the same can be said for India's human rights abuses in Kashmir, a crisis in which the United States remains notably muted because of its fledgling alliance with India against China. You see, laying claims to moral leadership requires, well, it requires exercising leadership and morality, an exercise one cannot undertake without first submitting to transparency and accountability. But you can't be transparent and accountable while slapping sanctions on independent and international bodies that investigate allegations of war crimes, including the International Criminal Court. Now, you remember that in June of last year, President Trump issued an executive order authorizing asset freezes and travel bans on ICC officials as punishment for vowing to investigate allegations of war crimes in Afghanistan and the Palestinian territories. But just so we are crystal clear here, the ICC stated its intent to investigate all allegations of war crimes, including those committed by the Taliban and Hamas. Significantly, both the Taliban and Hamas have welcomed ICC investigators, whereas Israel and the United States, on the other hand, have held a collective freakout in controlling allies into denouncing and threatening the ICC. Leading one to ponder which parties are acting in a manner that suggests they have something to hide and which are clearly are not. Look, we know the US committed war crimes in Afghanistan because its most loyal and obedient lapdog, Australia, which is the only country to follow the United States into every single one of its foreign wars since the Second World War, has confessed its forces committed war crimes in Afghanistan. I mean, full props to Australia here. Its government heard credible allegations regarding the criminal behaviour of its special forces and it convened a four-year investigation to get to the bottom of said allegations. And this is what it found that 19 current or ex-Special Forces soldiers should be investigated by the Australian police over the unlawful killings of prisoners, farmers and civilians in the period spanning 2009 to 2013. And that platoon commanders encouraged or insisted junior soldiers execute prisoners to achieve their first kill and place weapons and other items near Afghan bodies to cover up evidence of war crimes. What these particular Australian soldiers did meets the textbook definition of cold-blooded murder. But the way in which the Australian government has handled these allegations is what transparency and accountability looks like. A nation can only learn from the past and avoid repeating the same mistakes in the future if it acknowledges and makes amends for its moral wrongdoings. So isn't it high time the United States government comes clean on its war crimes too? Okay, granted, President Biden gets some credit for lifting sanctions against the ICC, but he then loses points for refusing to acknowledge the legitimacy of the court out of fear that doing so will expose US military personnel to criminal indictment. But if Biden wants to beat out China in this contest between liberal democracy and illiberal authoritarianism, then he has no choice but to take the moral high road, one signposted with culpability and contrition. And there's much the US must fess up to when it comes to Afghanistan. US war plans have bombed schools, hospitals, mosques, and marketplaces from the air, and its ground forces have carried out countless number of civilian massacres in towns and villages throughout the country. Even the most conservative estimates by local and international rights groups suggest that nearly 50,000 Afghan civilians have been killed and more than double that have been injured in the 20 years since the US invasion. But not only has the US rejected findings of independent observers, but also it has often falsely blamed its Afghan allies of ordering and carrying out the attacks. 
And when the US military does eventually get around to investigating civilian casualties, it does so only in a ham-fisted manner, with one study showing that 85% of the 228 official US military investigations conducted in Afghanistan, Iraq and Syria between 2002 and 2015 didn't include a single visit to a casualty site. In fact, the Pentagon refuses to investigate war crimes even when international scrutiny and attention is at its highest. Like that time in 2015 when a US military gunship attacked a Doctors Without Borders hospital in Kunduz, killing 42 patients and medical staff while injuring dozens of others. Some patients were burned alive in their beds as the gunship fired upon the hospital for more than 30 minutes, despite there being no doubt whatsoever about the identity and location of the hospital. In fact, the US commanders overseeing the operation failed to call off the attack until a full eight minutes after being alerted by Doctors Without Borders that the gunship was firing upon its hospital. But not a single individual involved in the attack was referred for criminal charges, which would surprise nobody given the US military goes to great lengths to protect its personnel from prosecutors outside the regular chain of command. Which, of course, is exactly why an independent or ICC investigation into alleged US war crimes is absolutely necessary, especially because I have borne witness to the survivors of US war crimes, having interviewed a half dozen Somali victims of US drone strikes at a refugee camp outside Mogadishu last year. Look, I'll come back to that in a moment. But first consider this. In the 10 years since the US military has been carrying out a secretive drone war in Somalia, the Pentagon has admitted to killing only two Somali civilians, despite local journalists documenting evidence of more than 300 civilian casualties. The survivors I spoke to said US drone strikes struck their village around March 10 of last year, killing four men, a local imam, a grandmother and two young boys, forcing them to leave their farmlands for the safety of the Somali capital. One of the survivors said this, and I quote, The attacks just kept on coming. Our homes destroyed, livestock destroyed, crops destroyed, people obliterated. Our children and I face so much agony and suffering after being forced to flee, end quote. Another said this, and I quote, They began firing down on crops. We saw dead and wounded everywhere. Then the next day it happened again, and then it happened a third day in a row. My grandmother died when shrapnel from the missile hit her heart, end quote. Now here comes the kicker. The US military acknowledged it had carried out drone strikes in their region during this period, but denied all allegations of civilian casualties, despite me and other journalists having proven its denials to be a bold-faced lie. Clearly, if the US lies about the killings of a half dozen Somali farmers on a single day in March of last year, then how many other killings has it denied and covered up in the two decades of the war and terror in its operations throughout Africa, Middle East, and Central Asia? Well, we do notice much that more than a half a million Muslims have been killed in military operations conducted by the US in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Pakistan since the 9-11 attacks, with civilians making up roughly 50% of total casualties. That's 250,000 innocent men, women, and children killed in just three countries, remembering that the US military has also conducted extensive operations in Yemen, Somalia, and Syria. Look, I know Barack Obama has come to be known as the drone strike president. But Donald Trump killed more civilians in three years than Obama did in eight, mostly because he loosened Obama-era rules of engagement and implemented what he called, quote, annihilation tactics, which is just a really nice way of saying carpet bomb ISIS held cities into dust, a strategy that killed more than 5,000 Syrian civilians in Raqqa in 2017 alone, which is almost twice the number of Americans killed on 9-11. Well, the ball is now firmly in President Biden's court. He has a rare opportunity particularly with the 20th anniversary of 9-11 approaching, to take a step towards righting these wrongs, a path to redemption that starts with first acknowledging war crimes and human rights violations in the Muslim world. To remain stubbornly defiant and unapologetic is to hand China a huge advantage in the contest between democracy and authoritarianism, international law and international gangsterism, and human rights and human rights abuses. There's just no other way to cut it. Well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you for tuning in. Please like and subscribe to this channel and help spread the word with your family and friends on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And a final reminder to consider supporting this endeavor by becoming a member of this show at patreon.com slash cjwellen. But for now, good night, good morning, or good day, wherever you are, and stay blessed.